Um, so this afternoon we are going to discuss the notion of legitimacy and how it should be rethought. And uh, I'm just going to uh, act as a traffic light, so no, nothing more than that. So uh, the rules are that we're going to give about 15 minutes to each of the speakers, uh, which uh, immediately I beg to stick to that, uh, to that uh, schedule. Uh, then we can uh, also allow 15 minutes for the discussants. Uh, and uh, if we are all very good and precise, uh, this should allow us a further 15 minutes uh, for uh, questions or discussion. Uh, and so uh, at four, we can stop and then have the final uh, keynote speech about, uh, once again, legitimacy and the role of the EU courts. So this is, uh, uh, let's say, the organization of the afternoon. Uh, and without uh, further delay, I leave the floor uh, to uh, Liz Rai, a uh, professor of contemporary history at the Norwegian University for Science and Technology. And uh, uh, particularly pleased because, as we were commenting before, uh, we are the only two historians, so we are very thrilled about that. But nonetheless, the rules apply to historians as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good afternoon. So the European crisis is facing a crisis. The European Union is fighting a crisis of legitimacy. And this is the reason why we are here today. And it's also the reason why the EU has decided to come to this research project, which aims for a more complete understanding of the current discontent, as well as the proposal to how to bridge gap between the EU and its citizens. Can you hear me? No. Uh, so, uh, uh, Thank you. Is it better now? Yes. So the current situation it's not easy to come to grips with because on the one hand we have a situation where the share of votes for parties that oppose European integration has more than doubled in the course of the last decade. But on the other hand we have Eurobarometer surveys which show that trust in the European Union is at its highest level since 2010. What the Eurobarometer surveys also show is that trust in the EU or the tendency to think of the EU as a good thing for one's country varies considerably. Take a country like Denmark. In Denmark, 60% of the population state that they tend to trust the EU. While here in Italy, the level of trust in the EU is down to 36%. But it used to be the other way around. At the very first Eurobarometer survey in 1974, only 35% of the Danes said that they considered EU membership a good thing for their country. While in Italy at the time, 77% of the respondents thought that EU membership was a good thing. And these changes in public opinion with regard to the EU are important because if we are to come up with a cure for the EU or at least with substantiated proposals on how to enhance its legitimacy we need to set the diagnosis right and for that we need a perspective that can inform us about the depth and the nature of the present day situation we need a historical perspective Within ReConnect, uh, I study critical junctures in European integration history with a view to identify and explain ideas of democracy and the rule of law that have made a mark on the EU. A critical juncture is a decisive point in history, a point in time where political agency and choice sets, in this case, the EU, on a certain path. So I'm not interested in any critical juncture, but junctures that have shaped EU-level democracy and rule of law. 
The EU treaties are instances of such critical junctures, points in time where the member states have delegated authority to EU institutions, points in time where the balance of power have sh has shifted between the EU institutions or between the EU and the participating states. So this is an approach that takes as a given that history matters and that politics is a process that unfolds over time. It presupposes that decisions, such as the decision to set up a particular institutional structure, have long-term consequences. And I would like to use the opportunity here today to illustrate this argument with a few examples from the historical literature. The European Union builds on an institutional structure that was deliberately undemocratic. The 1951 Treaty of Paris marked the victory of the functional approach to European integration, which now effectively outconquered the competing approach that European federalists had advocated since the final years of World War II. So the Europe that emerged at the beginning of the 1950s was the Europe of Jean Monnet. It was not the Europe of Altiero Spinelli. And the institutional structure that the 1951 Treaty of Paris established is interesting because it lives on in the present day EU, but also because of the way it reflected contemporary concerns and the preferences of key actors. The novelty in this setup was the high authority the mighty predecessor of today's commission. The high authority was the brainchild of Jean Monnet and his insistence on a strong executive power reflected his personal experiences with inter-allied cooperation during the world wars as well as with planning in France after World War II. On a more general level, the fate in experts, the elite orientation and supranationalism that marked the coal and steel community was also a reaction against the mobilization of masses associated with totalitarianism and the failure of the Intergovernmental League of Nations to prevent World War II. <coughs> the Common Assembly had no legislative powers and the Council of Ministers only saw the day because of Dutch and Belgian insistence. So the architects of the first European community was not concerned with the need to win the hearts and minds of the people. Their concern was with the participating governments. And Altiero Spinelli was one of the critics of this orientation. Monet has the great merit of having built Europe, he reportedly said, and the great responsibility to have built it badly. In the decades that followed, the lack of participation and accountability did not seem to bother the European public. So this is the age of permissive consensus. It's marked by support for European integration, but by a support that does not go very deep or is very enthusiastic. Intergovernmental approaches dominate historical research <laughs> into this period. And within this strand of research, the EU is interpreted as a means to legitimize the nation states. European integration was, as Alan Millward fam famously has claimed, the European rescue of the nation states. So Millward's point of departure is that <clears throat> after two world wars and the economic crisis of the 1930s, the European nation states needed to reinvent themselves. After a long period, where these states had proved blatantly incapable of protecting their citizens, of attending to their basic needs, they had to offer something new. So in the wake of World War II, and at a point in time where alternative ideas on the organization of society were gaining ground, the nation states set out to recreate themselves on a much broader social basis than before as a means to legitimize their position as the main unit <coughs> in the political organization of society. This they did through policies of growth, of employment, of welfare. And in these processes, 
the ECSC and the later EEC were the means, not the ends. At the time of the Treaty of Maastricht, the age of permissive consensus had come to a definite end. And this is an interesting juncture because there is so much going on inside the EU, inside the member states, and on the international scene that it's not obvious what the sources of popular discontent are. You have the completion of the single market that offers new opportunities, but also new competition. And you have the Treaty of Maastricht, which strengthens the legislative powers of the European Parliament, but which also marks the passage from economic community to political union. And this all happens in a context of economic hardship, of new war in Europe, and the subsequent arrival of hundreds and thousands of refugees. What we do know is that in several countries, popular support for the EU was on a downward trend before 1992. And this was, for instance, the case here in Italy. Historical research has linked the drop in support for the EU in the early 1990s to the early strategy of Jean Monnet. It was the legacy of Jean Monnet's technocracy and elitism, the argument goes, to leave the Commission a weak and fragile democratic legitimacy. And as long as attempts to rectify the democratic deficit concentrated on the relationship between the Council and the European Parliament, an important part of the problem remained. Other scholars highlight the transfer of monetary power to the ECB, arguing that this disenfranchised the citizens, took authority away from national governments, and fueled a crisis of legitimacy that became manifest at the end of the decade. The EU policy-making machinery broke down, John Gillingham writes, at the very time that regulations and directives <coughs> implementing the single European Act began to register in the lives of ordinary people. These days, the European Union presents <coughs> itself as a union founded on values. The Treaty of Lisbon's Article 2 identified, as we learned this morning, respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights as the Union's founding values. And with, this entry into, uh, with the entry into force of this treaty, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union has also become legally binding. So much has happened, at least on paper, since the Treaty of Maastricht provided the first treaty provisions on fundamental rights protection. Political scientists argue that democratization in the EU is the result of constitutional conflict between institutional <coughs> actors. Strong actors in this system push, the argument goes, for further integration <coughs> in order to increase efficiency without paying much attention to democratic legitimacy. But such behavior leaves, in turn, room for less powerful actors to question the legitimacy of integration and put normative pressure on the powerful actors. So democracy in the EU has normative origins, Frank Schimmelfenig argues, that differ from the economic or social origins of democracy highlighted in studies of the nation states. Historians tend to agree with this line of reasoning. Irene Karamusi and Emma de Angelis show how the process of identifying the EC with democracy started in the European Parliament, where MIPs managed to turn, and I quote, the existence of their at the time near powerless institution into a symbol of the community's commitment to democracy. Karamusi and de Angelis also highlight the historical context arguing that the EU enlargement processes functioned as catalysts for the evolution of EU democracy. So to sum up, uh, these snapshots uh, of research into EU history suggest that the EU institutional architecture has original flaws that have never been properly rectified. And they give hints where to look 
for the driver's embracement mm -hmm. of EU-level democracy. The historical research also points out that the nation states have always set limits to European integration. And in so doing, this research offers valuable perspectives on the present day situation and interesting points of departure for the research that lies ahead of us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, now this is most unfortunate that we must get back to legal scholarship with <laughs> Professor. <laughs> I can, uh, with, with Cesare, I can, <laughs> with Cesare, I can, I think I can uh, dare this kind of jokes. Uh, Cesare is an old friend, he's full professor of constitutional law, Sapienza, University of Rome, and uh, uh, he's going to speak about input legitimacy and output legitimacy of the European Union. Where are we now? Cesare. My story would be much more brief than uh, the story which was described before, uh, but it's not less complex, however. It concerns uh, a term, or <coughs> rather a distinction between, uh, uh, it, it, this distinction came from an old dichotomy that between uh, government by the people and government for the people, very, very old dichotomy, which was reshaped in terms, at the end of the 20th century, in terms of an opposition between an input legitimacy grounded on political representation and an output legitimacy, namely the capacity of governmental politics, policies of solving common problems of the governed. And it was, this dichotomy referred to the EU institutional system inter alia by Fritz Sharp, Gian Domenico Maione and others, with a view to uh, affirm that the core governing functions of the EU do not need an input legitimation, given the strong output legitimacy they were provided with. I will not question whether the EU did not need then a democratic legitimation. My point of departure is rather that the input-output dichotomy can be used as an analytical tool aimed at verifying the changes occurred in the last decades in the EU institutional system. Already in 2003, Scharf himself insist, uh, noted that although the EU is known to be in charge of limited competencies and it lacks a government in the sense of a political visible center of power that could be held politically accountable. Due inter alia to the success of the internal market and the monetary union, a constitutional asymmetry was emerging between the legal constraints following from European liberalization and national social protection rules. These conflicts, added Sharp, will pale in comparison to the political crisis that will arise if the Commission and the Court should be allowed to continue in applying European competition law to the core areas of welfare state services. Then we can assume that protecting the EU output legitimacy against political intervention was already at risk, but as we think now, it was the financial crisis that changed many of these data. Even these provisions of Sharp, of Sharp suddenly appeared obsolete. It was the very EU economic efficiency that proved to be more vulnerable than ever. Measures adopted for constructing the <coughs> crisis generated a slow but continuous process of fiscal integration, whose effects were, however, very controversial. As uh, Francesco Nicoli puts it, on the one hand, fiscal integration is not sufficiently developed yet to reestablish European-wide output legitimacy. On the other hand, 
the first elements of the new economic governance aimed to constrain domestic behavior and increase the power of insulated institutions in fi fiscal matters, generating a democratic deficit. So he speaks of a twin legitimacy deficit, not sufficient redis redistributive policies to achieve output legitimacy, but sufficient progress towards insulated decision-making on fiscal policy to fail to reach input legitimacy. Uh, I share this view about the twin legitimacy deficit related to the outputs not less than two inputs now affecting European integration. But I also believe that an understanding of such deficit should take account of the transformation occurred within the EU institutional scenario and economic governance in particular. Uh, since the Maastricht Treaty, many of us who take for granted that the governance was affected from a structural asymmetry between the quasi-federal powers of the ECB and the weak coordination of the member states' political economy. And some of us would add that such asymmetry was ill-founded not because it contradicted the premises on which functions are usually distributed between uh, governments and central banks within nation states, but because of the dysfunctional processes which it engendered within the EU itself. While looking at the post-crisis EMU's governance, uh, we should conclude that the asymmetry generated a paradox which can be caught even in the European Court of Justice case law. Let us compare Goweiler with Pringle. Uh, viewed contextually, these cases reveal the paradox resulting from the measures adopted in the Eurozone as institutional responses to the crisis, namely the pretension of national governments to create a system based on automatism and the discretionary powers acquired by the European Central Bank beyond the maintenance of price stability. It is this double contradiction that characterizes the Eurozone's crisis management. The issue at stake cannot simply consist in what is left of the powers of the member states in the sphere of economic policy vis-a-vis -vis the emergence of an extremely powerful actor as the uh, European Central Bank, but also the imposition of structural convergence of the southern with the northern, um, northern economies uh, and command and control interventions guided by the presumption that one size will fit all, accompanied by the risk of destructive effects. Uh, as Vivian Schmidt uh, wrote in a 2015 European Commission discussion paper, as the crisis evolved from two, um, 200 um, 2010 and 2014, and as EU institutional actors became increasingly con concerned about uh, continued poor economic performance and growing political volatility, they slowly began to reinterpret the rules and recalibrate the numbers, albeit uh, mostly without admitting it in their communicative discourse to the public. Instead, Vivian Schmidt continues, they generally continue to insist that they were sinking to the rules even as behind closed doors in their coordinative discourses of policy construction, they were debating, contesting, and compromising on rules reinterpretation. The increasing disconnection between what EU actors have said and what they have done has also contributed to major divides in public perceptions of their actions, generally splitting northern and southern Europe, but also within them the winners and the losers of economic, econo uh, European economic integration. Fine, uh, end of the quotation. However, we should be aware that that increase in disconnection was not provoked by all EU actors. As it is well known, the emergence of a true parliamentary form of government as enshrined in the Lisbon Treaty and complemented in 2014 with a conventional device such as the Spitzenkandidat system was practically vanished 
<coughs> by the dominant role that the European Council acquired due to the fallout of the global financial crisis. Such role was not without costs for national governments, pushing them to the center of the EU institutional stage. For a long time, they had preferred to remain behind it. Given the dispersal of power affecting the EU institutional arrangement, national governments were able to leave to the EU the burden of hard choices, starting with those concerning the national budget without paying electoral costs. It was argu arguably in their own interest both to maintain the EU system as it is, with no chance of identifying accountable rulers behind the blue sky and the stars, and to let people believe the, the media tale of Brussels as a seat of inaccessible technocracy. Although clearly artificial, the divide between national politics and supranational technocratic governance permeated <coughs> the popular imagination, hiding the dilemma between the adoption of long-term policies that require time to be understood by citizens and are not without risks in terms of electoral approval, <coughs> and the mere administration of the present with the related dismissal of politics. This happens also at domestic level, I would like to add, without reading. It's the same thing. While regularly preferring the latter, namely administration of the present, the national government's condition is to lay the blame of the European malaise on the obscure and unelected officials of Brussels. At the time of the Lisbon Treaty's enactment, national governments were still attempting to hide behind the EU flag for fueling popular distrust at home against Europe. And yet they were sowing off the branch they were sitting on. It was the Eurozone crisis that increased the dominance of intergovernmentalism to the point of pushing them to the center stage. The old game was over. The European Council's crucial role in the adoption of financial measures aimed at reducing national expenditures for the citizens' welfare could no longer be denied. It complemented for the people an image of the EU that already consisted of the fictions and the vacuity of its official language as well as of the tricks of national governments. Being presented as a defensive move against external threats, the populist attacks on the EU have thus appeared genuine to huge sectors of the electorate, particularly to those exacerbated by the scarce governmental response to their basic needs and forged the idea of a concrete popular will. Here we are then. Apparently, the crisis transformed the input-output legitimacy distinction into an intractable dilemma between technocratic governance and populism. However, while looking at how the need for fiscal integration was viewed as a response to the Eurozone crisis, a different conclusion may result. The technocracy versus populism dilemma may rather be a symptom of a twin legitimacy deficit due to the European Council's insistence in tightening up the rules of a game that could, re could rest forever in its own hands at the expense of the European enterprise no less than of democracy. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Cesare. And I immediately give the floor to Nicola Lupo, uh, who is a professor here at Lewis, so here he does really not need to be introduced, and is going to tell us something about the role of parliaments in the EU between legitimacy and accountability. Nicola. Thanks, Giovanni. It's a great pleasure being involved uh, in this uh, wonderful research project which addresses a crucial issue for European democracy, and most of all, it asks the right and urgent <coughs> research question. We know that every a research needs a very good research question at the basis, 
I think that the research question is very well framed in this case because we, the European Union is not facing a problem of lack of democracy. And uh, maybe we, we, one of the resu results today could also be if we still have to stick to the uh, abuse expression of democratic deficit. We have uh, Andreas Foles here, who was one of the people in 2005 argued in favor of keeping the, the terminology. And I think that from what we have heard today, we have some, uh, uh, some issues on it. But instead, the problem is a problem of a concrete and articulated functioning of democracy in a multi-level setting deeply changing and challenging its already very delicate mechanisms, times, and rhythms. And that's why uh, the title of the research is, uh, in my view, very, very happy, let's say, as it uh, uh, recalls a formula, that expression that I like much more, that I prefer the, uh, to the one of democratic deficit, which is, which is the one of democratic disconnect, mm. which was used by uh, Peter Lindset in 2010. And, and of course, these problems also expose the European Union to all the enemies of democracy in Europe and worldwide, I would say. Uh, so it is absolutely correct in, in an academic research, uh, different is, uh, when we talk, we, we have politicians, we, I think I'll time to be back on this in the concluding part of my speech, to start from concepts. <coughs> there are many conceptual ambiguities in the EU that derives, as we have heard, from different histories, different constitutional identities and traditions, uh, from also from different languages. Uh, if we, uh, as legal scholars, of course, I, I care about what uh, legal text, our legal text has written, which vocabulary they use, also in order to build a common conceptual framework that can be used also for different uh, disciplines. And in, in this case, uh, it's clear that the job <coughs> made by the EU lawyer linguist uh, not necessarily can kind of clarify every conceptual note, and some of these conceptual notes are deliberately left open, uh, making uh, uh, proper use of multilingualism. So many ambiguities, for instance, refer to the concept of legitimacy, of course, and uh, uh, there is a translation problem. In many languages, there is a distinction, of, uh, uh, some overlaps, of course, but uh, between legality, legitimacy, legitimation. In English, we have even some doubts about the, the use of the word legitimation, legitimization, and that's something that it's, uh, doesn't help, in that saying, uh, uh, and of course, in English language prefer to use legitimacy with many, many adjectives uh, attached to them. And this similar uh, ambiguities relate to the expression accountability, and we have Julian Navarro today uh, dealing with this. Uh, in this case, it's the opposite. I would say the English language is richer than most of the other European languages, and they distinguish uh, uh, rather sharply between accountability on the one side and responsibility on the other side. Uh, the, the first one, when uh, coupled with the adjective democratic, uh, as it happens in Article 10 of the Treaty of the European Union, offers some overlaps <laughs> with democratic legitimacy. And, uh, of course, responsibility could be social, ethical, legal, political, and so on. So, of course, these issues exceed my far my task and the object of my contribution is not going to address them. Uh, and I'm confident that some important clarification will derive from the works of the working package too and from the overall results of the research. My task here, here is to concentrate on, on the ambiguities that concern the role of the parliaments, both the European Parliament and national parliaments in the EU, considering parliament as they are, a crucial institution for determining accepting levels of both legitimacy and accountability of the European democracy. And I will try to do it very, very quickly, uh, addressing just, uh, uh, as it is normally the initial stage, some few and relatively shared starting points, just three starting points, I hope could be shared, and some uh, three, uh, let's say, amb open ambiguities, still open ambiguities that could be maybe at the center of our uh, <coughs> research agenda. Uh, the first starting point is that the legitimacy of the European Union, as well as its own accountability, do not rely only on the European Parliament, but also on national parliamentary institutions. Uh, this uh, whose good functioning is required by Article 12 of the treaty. Uh, we know that, that what's uh, recalled in Article 10, but it's true that representative democracy is founded on two channels, one more direct constituted by the European Parliament, the other more indirect 
the rise on relying on the national forms of government and therefore essentially on the role of national parliaments, not only but mainly on them. And this, uh, this feature is not something that derives from the Treaty of Lisbon, uh, although this art Article 10 appeared with, the, uh, with this treaty, but it's something that uh, uh, is since the beginning, at the, since the inception of the European integration process. I'm not uh, going farther on this. The second point is that the Europeanization process has gradually interested in different ways and times all the national parliaments. And this process has been fairly accelerated thanks to the recalled European powers attributed to national parliaments by the Lisbon Treaty. And these had also some positive effects on the Europeanization of national public opinions. The uh, EU has become a relevant issue in all national debates, uh, in a sense of another, not only because of the Europeanization process of national parliament, but also thanks, institutionally speaking, to this process. Uh, this notwithstanding, I would say that, however, their European role, the European role of national parliaments, is still mainly played individually, and is played individually, not collectively. And I would say that European parliaments or national parliaments, starting from the early warning mechanism and the instruments of parliamentary cooperation, play and still play an important uh, uh, role in, the, in, in diminishing the information gap uh, existing between parliament and governments, but they are not substituting the function that represents the core of the parliamentary, I would say, non-legislative activity, that is to direct and scrutinize their own government, also on the European Union issues. So I th would say that it's rather settled nowadays that it's not the European parliament could not represent the main functions for national parliaments. They are, let's say, uh, additional functions that can help national parliaments to exercise their own traditional function of scrutinizing their own government. Don't forget that 27 out of 28 member states have a formal government in according to which there should be, there needs to be a confidence relationship within the government and one of the two houses of parliament. So this means something. This is the main function of the parliament still now. And the third and final uh, uh, shared point is, and that also this morning that was clearly said by many speakers, that the European Parliament has done all that it could by using its democratic added value since 1979 in enlarging its own function, both in legislation and oversight. The European Parliament has been very, very effective in this endeavor, managing to, managing to parliamentarize even uh, uh, foreign and defense policies up to a certain extent, and ensure some degree of accountability of the action of the European Central Bank and the European agencies. Uh, just, to couple, just to quote a couple of examples. So increasing the overall level of democratic accountability of many European policies, uh, policies, nevertheless, there are still policies and bodies on which there is a lack of parliamentary scrutiny, and therefore of democratic accountability. The clearest and more striking example is the fiscal policy of the Eurozone, which is managed mainly at EU level by informal institutions, so-called informal institutions, such as the Eurogroup, Eurosummit, that are subject to the parliamentary oversight, neither by national parliament, at least collectively, nor by the European parliament. And, and in this part, the critique uh, raised by Annette Piketty, Sacristie, and Boucher, I think, is rather well-focused and well-centered. So let's, uh, if I, yep, just three, uh, the three, um, ambigu three ambiguities to be addressed, uh, to be, clarified, hopefully, in the following uh, uh, steps of the research. Uh, the first one is how to consider asymmetries and enhanced cooperation in parliamentary bodies, I would say. That's really a crucial choice, also to address the last lack I was uh, trying to identify, last the difficulty, uh, uh, the parliamentary assembly for the Eurozone, and the answers are very differentiated. According to the European Parliament, it's possible to address it by working on parliamentary committees and parliamentary procedures. The evil example of the UK Kingdom is uh, quoted and up to a certain extent they try to import it. Uh, according to others, as I was saying, a new parliamentary body is required. Others, uh, third position, argue or take, fully take advantage of interparliamentary bodies. Uh, interparliamentary cooperation and so on. Indeed, here some conceptual ambiguities exist also regarding the same concept of parliaments. And uh, there are some disagreement about uh, within, between courts. 
if the European Parliament is a real parliament or not. The, the case law of the Bundesverfassung Gericht is still there. And the uh, European Court of Human Rights thinks differently on this. But also the qualification on the, of the Council as a branch of the bicameral EU legislator, which is still dominant about political scientists, is still really convincing. Can we really talk of a parliament from a, from a functional point of view? Yes, the Treaty of Lisbon brings some arguments in this. But from a structural point of view, it's rather far away from being a parliament council. So, so this is uh, possibly uh, the f one first ambiguities. The second one is which respective roles should the European Parliament and the national parliaments play in the parliamentary cooperation, in, in, in interparliamentary cooperation. Uh, something has been clarified, but uh, uh, for, for instance, Article 9 is the legal basis uh, preferred instead of Article 10 of Protocol Number 1. <coughs> but in any case, who's going to lead it? Uh, uh, the EP or national parliaments? Does it depend on the policy addressed, which role for the speakers' conference? And also, this, yeah, we have a conceptual problem, which is the aim of interparliamentary cooperation, generally speaking. There are many different aims, and we can discuss about it. Last ambiguity uh, is probably the most basic and conceptual, indeed. And it's, uh, also this morning, there were some referral to this uh, by Julian Navarro. Which kind of form of government, of regime, if you were, is there in the European Union? Is the European Union a parliamentary government? is the separation or fusion of powers between the European Parliament and the Commission. Uh, here in Lewis, we have very differentiated positions. We have an internal debate on this. If you want, uh, uh, Sergio Fabrini, uh, argue, our dean of the Department of Political Science, uh, is arguing uh, for the separation of powers uh, thesis, while Andrea Manzella, the, the president of the Center for Parliamentary Studies, and Lewis argues on the opposite on the uh, parliamentary nature of the European Forum of Government. Of course, we know about the, the attempt to establish what I would call a constitutional convention with the Spitzer candidate, which relied exactly on the ambiguities of the treaties, of the treaty, stimulating a very wide uh, debate uh, and moved towards a parliamentary form of government, as it is recognized by, the, by some scholars, and also very, by a very recent decision by the Italian Constitutional Court number 239 of 2008, in which recognize that there has been an undoubted transformation into parliamentary direction of the form of government of the European Union. I'm quoting the passage by the Italian Constitutional Court. Uh, so uh, the next uh, elections and the following months will probably be decisive, uh, as has been already remarked by many scholars. To conclude, really, in uh, two minutes, one uh, statement for each minute. One is a methodological suggestion, and the last line is the, just on the drawn also from the debate of yesterday. We had the internal workshop from which there were some, some, some interesting uh, uh, hints. The methodological suggestion to work on the procedural intersections between legal orders. Uh, uh, what we could call the, maybe the Euro national parliamentary procedures. The European Union is full of Euro national procedures, both at administrative level and administrative <coughs> law scholars have already uh, gone uh, studying, identified this object, but also at constitutional parliamentary level, that we are full of cases in which a procedure involves both institutions of European Union level and national institutions, and they are regulated partly by the EU law and partly by national constitutional law. Uh, the, the, it's, uh, uh, so they are not exceptions or deviations. They are uh, what is our uh, constitution, our current constitution is made of mainly. Finally, uh, just to, to leave with a, a very general uh, assumption, I must say that uh, as a scholars, we like to uh, clarify ambiguities. Uh, we like to have clear concepts. And, uh, but on the contrary, I would say that politicians uh, love to play around conceptual ambiguities. They, and also maybe, uh, also from an historical perspective, in international politics, and if we look at the European integration process, the European integration process has been built just leaving aside all the disagreements on concepts. 
and where it was possible to find and so move the attention on the points in which we could agree, they could agree, they could find an agreement, and bringing with them many ambiguities. Some ambiguities nowadays are, uh, we have to address them, and we are trying to give a hand as scholars in clarifying them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. And now I leave the floor to Andrea San Giovanni, who is chair in social political theory at the European University Institute in Florence. And Andrea is going to tell us something about what role, if any, should democratic decision making play in identifying principles of justice for the European Union? Thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me? OK, good. Right, so I'm quite anxious to be useful to our organizers here. And as a political philosopher, I thought it would be uh, most useful to talk a little bit about the relationship uh, between three values that appear in Article 2 and that uh, we discussed this morning, namely the values of justice, democracy, and legitimacy. So it'll be a kind of conceptual exploration. I'll try to set an agenda for our particular uh, research um, endeavor rather than to answer substantively what I think principles of justice, democracy, or legitimacy actually are. And in particular, my conclusion, I'll try to convince you that justice should have a privileged uh, place in that triptych. So between democracy, um, legitimacy, and justice, justice should have a privileged place. So I think it's very uh, obvious when one turns to, for example, the voluminous literature on the democratic deficit, uh, or if one turns to the policy literature proposing different ways in which the EU might go in the future. Um, it's astounding. There's a kind of technocratic bias to this <coughs> literature. Uh, many of those questions are questions of inst institutional engineering. I can't uh, tell you how many times I've been to talks, for example, on uh, Eurozone reform, uh, when someone says, well, if you try to you know, ask, well, what about the distributional consequences of Eurozone reform? And they mention, they say, well, no, there's an economic rationale. There's an economic logic to the reforms I'm giving you. We don't need to ask those further normative questions at all. Uh, same thing with the democratic deficit literature, which, of course, is much more normative. Um, but there, too, there's a question which is obscured from view. So let me put it to you this way. Imagine you had the, uh, your ideal democracy. So you're procedurally your favorite institutional setup for the European Union. So all your dreams uh, were satisfied there would still be a very fundamental question that would remain, namely, what ends should you use all that democracy to do? What should we then do with this democracy? What ends should we pursue? Now, by ends, I don't mean just the finalité politique of the EU. Again, that question about the finalité politique of the EU is also a kind of technocratic one. It's always about, are we reaching federalism or some union of states or something looser? But rarely, the, the question is asked what the end, what standards we should be using to uh, evaluate the ends that should be pursued by uh, European integration. And very important among those ends, I want to suggest, is uh, justice. So we should ask, what principles of justice ought we to use to evaluate what the EU does in brief? So, uh, we can bring it out with an example that came up this morning. Giuliano Amato mentioned, uh, very interestingly, he said, oh yes, the parliament. And you'll remember he said, the parliament should have an autonomous taxation power. He said, very controversial statement. What reason did he give? Very interesting. He said, well, because that way the EU will have more authority. The parliament will have more authority. Now that's a rather odd way of motivating that thought, if you think about it. So what are the obvious objections to an autonomous taxation policy that any member state, uh, especially in the North, would have? 
What a German would say is, my issue is not so much with authority and whether you know, parliament should have authority. They would say, why should I pay my tax dollars to support you Southern lot down there? That's what the problem with an autonomous taxation power, we see it with the Eurozone budget now and discussions. The question is a distributional one. People want to know why, as a matter of fairness, the North, to put it crudely, um, ought to support the South. Are there reasons of fairness? Is it charity, humanitarianism? Is that what the Germans owe the Greeks? Or is it something more? Do the Greeks have a claim in justice that they've been treated uh, unfairly? Um, so that's the kind of question that I think um, deserves a greater place in European Union studies. If you look at the literature, it's amazing how few scholars have addressed it. It's really quite striking. And again, I think that bespeaks uh, the, the or reflects that technocratic uh, bias that I mentioned before. Now, what's the relationship between uh, justice and democracy and legitimacy? So I want to mention three arguments that often people have for why, no, no, no. In fact, this asking the question about justice, as I just did, is the wrong question to ask. In fact, we should really be focusing on principles for democracy or principles of legitimacy for the European Union. So here are the three arguments. And I'm going to try to argue that they don't work. So the first argument is, well, justice is a matter of subjective preferences. Don't you see that everyone disagrees about what justice is. There's no stable answer to that question. So just as when we're trying to decide what, to, what, what restaurant to go to, we should put it to a vote. So it's the people who should decide um, via their democratic means what principles of justice should govern them. And that's because justice, hey, is a matter of subjective preference. Now there's a deep incoherence in that view because it assumes that principles of democracy are somehow not subject to the same kind of subjective preference balance. After all, people disagree just as much on what democracy is or ought to be as they disagree about justice. So then this, uh, this erstwhile objector will say, oh yes, but we should put democracy also to democratic test. But of course, that begs a question. Quite obviously, why not put it to a dictator to decide whether or not there should be democracy. Quite clearly, we have standards. We have reasons for affirming democracy, which are um, reasons, indeed, of justice. So that doesn't look like a very promising argument. Now, there's a second argument, which is related but slightly different. And that's an argument you often get uh, among some Habermasians. So the argument goes a little bit like this. They accept that there are objective criteria that there are for what justice is. But they think it's wrong for a philosopher, the engaged academic, to provide a theory of justice because we should let the people decide. So it's the people that through democratic debate and decision determine what justice objectively is. It's not a matter of subjective preference, but they determine objectively what uh, what justice is through democratic debate. But that too doesn't look very convincing at all. If we take it literally that democratic uh, debate and deliberation determines objectively what justice is, then there are obvious objections. What if the people get it wrong? What if uh, the democracy votes for tremendously heinous things that all of us would agree were unjust. Would we then say we were wrong about justice all along? Also, there's a deeper incoherence uh, to that um, kind of approach. And it's the following one. Imagine that you were convinced by that view. Imagine that every European citizen was convinced by that view, namely that democratic debate and deliberation is required to determine objectively what justice is. OK, so imagine you're going to a debate now to decide democratically what justice is. What should you vote for? If you believe the theory, then you should be waiting to hear what the outcome of the vote is. Because it's the vote and the deliberation that's going to tell you objectively what justice is. But if everyone in the room is sitting there waiting for everyone else to speak first, then no one's going to say anything. 
So there's a kind of deep incoherence in, in that sort of view. Perhaps you might say one could um, change the view and say, no, what I mean is not that democratic decision and deliberation determines the validity, the objective validity of principles, but rather that it's an epistemic thing. It helps us to get to the truth about what justice is. Given the disagreement, we should have a debate. That'll make us more capable of seeing the truth about justice, whatever it is. So this is of often an argument, too, for a vibrant scientific community, for universities. Let a hundred flowers bloom, and the truth will be more likely to emerge. But of course, that's a much weaker argument. Of course, we can be happy uh, to accept that. No one is saying, and no one who defends a theory of justice is saying that somehow the theory should preempt uh, de democratic de decision or that the philosophers should be kings. No one's saying that. The philosopher is only one voice among many, someone who has uh, more time uh, to, to reflect on these things and present them to a public. But they are a member of that public on all fours with everyone else. So of course they accept that epistemic function of uh, democratic debate and deliberation. So that looks too like it will be a weak argument. The third argument against uh, the view that, well, <coughs> we really shouldn't be wasting our time trying to develop uh, theories or principles of justice, say, for the European Union, is we should really be thinking about legitimacy. And this will be the last uh, point I make. Now, legitimacy, what, what, do, what, does, uh, what should we mean by legitimacy? Legitimacy is a standard by which we decide whether we should respect the decisions of some directive power, of some, someone who has power over us. Now, by respect, I mean uh, if that institution, say, is legitimate, then that gives you a duty not to interfere with its exercise of its power. In some cases, it also gives you a duty to obey. So that's a question of legitimacy. Notice that legitimacy becomes very important precisely when people disagree. So a theory of legitimacy should tell you why you should respect an institution even when you think it's unjust. Okay? It gives you, uh, as it were, a criteria of sufficiency, not optimality. So a theorist of legitimacy might be saying, well, look, the reason why it's a mistake to talk about justice is that justice gives you some kind of ideal, an optimum. But what we really need, for example, when we're talking about the EU, is uh, theories of legitimacy, of what's good enough. Not the best, but what's good enough. But note, too, here that this can't be quite right. Because we often, even when we're discussing Legitimacy, we often also uh, need to evaluate the ends of an institution in terms of whether they're just. So in an institution that is wildly unjust, that, say, uh, violates human rights, we would say is illegitimate for that reason. It falls outside uh, the scope of what we ought to respect. So in a way, it's what I'm trying to say is that justice is uh, a silent prologue to any discussion about what legitimacy itself requires. So if you want to put it in one way, you know, if you, if you imagine a target, yeah, uh, there's the bullseye of that target, that's justice. And then, so if, if you hit the target but not the bullseye, then that's legitimacy. You say, it's not optimally just, but we still have a reason to respect it. And if you miss the target entirely, then it's illegitimate and you have no reason to respect the institution at all. But notice here that the bullseye is defined and the target itself is defined in terms of the bullseye. We need to know in reference to what the optimum is, what the scope of uh, permissible derogation, as it were, from the optimum is, what we're allowed uh, to deviate from. And notice, too, that, of course, that's exactly what's happening in, for example, the Eurozone crisis. There's a, it's a crisis of legitimacy. So when people ask themselves about the distributional consequences of European integration, and they ask, are they fair? They're not just asking an ideal question about the optimum. They're also asking themselves whether they have a reason to respect the EU at all. 
So I think I'll just uh, wind up here. Um, I think it's essential that when we um, approach questions of legitimacy and democracy, we also have to uh, approach the prior question of what principles of justice or fairness we should think uh, govern the whole. So in this case, the European Union. So we're very familiar, of course, with how to do that at a domestic level. There's a huge literature. Uh, there's huge debates about what justice requires domestically when we're evaluating, say, social policy or housing policy or health policy, the amount of inequality which is acceptable uh, in a, a modern industrialized democracy. And we also have now uh, a lot to say about global justice. But we're much less clear when we're talking about institutions that are neither global nor national, that are at this regional level, just like the EU. So should we think of the EU um, as a single unit from which we, say, evaluate inequalities? Should the inequalities uh, between Germany and Bulgaria matter just as much as the inequalities within Germany between the West and the East? Are there reasons why we ought to object more when there's inequalities <coughs> within, say, Germany, rather than across Germany and Bulgaria? So those are questions that uh, uh, principles of justice would help us to address. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now our last speaker before the discussion, Carlos Closa Montero, professor at the Institute for Public Goods and Policies, Spanish National Research Council. And the topic is Reconciling Democracy and Rule of Law in the EU and in its Member States. So thank you very much. And uh, before I start with my talk, let me just thank for this invitation to be here. I'm not part of this work package, but I always feel very excited to contribute to the concept <coughs> parts. And um, also let me thank uh, the team at Luis, uh, <coughs> all of you, um, Leonardo, Nicola, Rafael, Cristina, Daniela, and Osuve, for the wonderful hospitality as always here in Rome. It's always a pleasure to, to come here. Now, the, the title of my presentation is not chosen by me. Uh, it has been proposed to me by Cristina Fassone, and uh, I think has done a, has found a very intelligent intuition here. If you look at the definition of our project, it's called Reconciling Europe with its Citizens Through Democracy and the Rule of Law. And the title that Christina suggests me is putting a question here is whether we should problematize the instrument that we are going to work in the project as something that's in inherently intention, whether there's some kind of uh, contradiction here. And I'm going to try to explore precisely this, this topic in my presentation, the possible contradiction between the, um, the two things. Now, what I am... What I'm going to try to do very, very quickly is to go through these uh, different elements in my presentation. I will do it very quickly because we don't have time. First, I will go to some, I will say something about the problems of definition of the concepts, which I think is central to this work package. I think it's uh, something that has to be really taken uh, care. Then I will enter into a, something which perhaps we haven't reflected enough, which is the difference between concepts, between values and principles as elements of uh, law, but not only law. I am going to go farther than that. Then I will try to present very briefly an overview of how these two elements, democracy and rule of law, deploy in a two-level polity, like the European Union. And then I will present the pragmatic problem currently in the European Union, meaning basically I take as a point of departure the situation with uh, uh, governments breaching the, the, the values of the rule of law in Poland and Hungary. And finally, uh, finally I will try to jump to some kind of very quick uh, conclusion. Now, let me start very... Uh, let me start very quickly with the first thing, uh, open concepts. And I think it would be easy for us to agree that both rule of law and democracy are highly contested uh, concepts. If you look, for instance, to the Venice Commission checklist of what the rule of law is, you will have uh, five categories with no less than 23 subcategories, quite, uh, quite a dense uh, <coughs> connotation for the concept. And I think this in the one hand, this very specific definition of the rule of law. But at the same time, the vagueness of the definition is what causes problems to have some kind of conceptual agreement. So it's a kind of paradox here. Either we have a very well-defined concept, very extensively defined, or we have a very vague concept. But in either case, we are bound to have disagreements about the meaning. And for democracy, I think we can argue something very similar. 
we know that uh, democracy means basically ruling of the people by the people and for the people, and this can be equated to a vote, equal voting. But beyond that, there are a number of elements that should uh, be incorporated into the notion of democracy. And as a matter of fact, we always try to qualify democracy. So we speak about liberal, representative, participatory, direct, and so on, even illiberal democracy. And again, this speaks about the difficulties to grab the concept. So my first uh, assumption for this talk is that we have concepts which are fairly vague and open-ended. Now, next to this, and here I want to open a, a different element which perhaps hasn't been put forward in this conference. I think it makes sense to distinguish between values and principles, something which is not so clear in our, in our talk. And uh, values speak uh, basically about uh, beliefs with a kind of uh, ethical, moral connotation. And values are very clearly simplified with quotes like solidarity, freedom, equality, and fraternity. Now, principles are something slightly different. Principles are <coughs> elements that structure a system. And structuring a system in a way that we can apprehend the essential characteristics of the system. And by a system, I mean everything, or everything could be a system. And those principles reflect the, the system design and the effective operation or use of the same system. Now, the samples of principle within the domain of uh, law would be consent of the government, separation of powers, rule of law, respect of fundamental rights. And before I go further, it's important to notice something. I think there is a hierarchical relation between values and principles. And I think values inspire principles. So principles have to be connected to these higher values, right? So then let me just throw again this assumption here. I, I have very little time, so I have to really be very, be economic with that. Now, uh, an important point is that when we speak about principles, we have to differentiate very clearly principle of law in general and constitutional principle, which is something that normally we kind of fuse in our normal parlance. We don't make this very, this difference very, very clear. And I think it's essential. Why is this essential? Because from that depends the whole structure of the, of the policy. Now, I am presenting here in a very quick way how values and principles translate into this two-level policy, which is the European Union. Here you have, in the one side, on the left-hand side, the European Union, on the other side, the member state level. And what you can see here is that the, that the European Union is very densely populated with certain kind of principles, uh, abundant number of principles in Article 2. But when you go to principles, what you find here is something which is slightly different. Proportionality, I, I mean here, explicit principles. Those principles are identified as such in the treaties. And of course, we can go to the charter and find even some other principles. But the principles are proportionality, subsidiarity, conferral. Those two later uh, speak to vertical division of powers, equality before the law, and democratic principle. And then you have some implicit principles, principles that are not explicitly identified as such in the treaties, but rather brought out by the case law of the European Court of Justice. Institutional equilibrium, very importantly. What you have in the member state level? Well, to be short, what I put here, there is a kind of recognition of equality of values between the Union and the member states, because of the referee in Article 2, values are common to the member states. So we take that there is a kind of isomorphism here. But when we come to the principal side, what we find at the level of the states, that is a large variety, for instance, with federalism, but then we have very clearly separation of powers. And here we have the big peace match I want to talk about. One hand, institutional equilibrium, a jurisprudential principle which is not explicit in the treaties. The other hand, separation of power, which is the basis of constitutional identity in all member states. And this asymmetry, this isomorphism, I think is the basis of our problems. Here, very quickly, I have, uh, I have gone through the constitutional definition of uh, separation of powers in the constitution of member states, and I come forward with this classification. I don't have a lot of time to, to, go to talk about that, but basically here the point is that all constitutions have some reflection of the principle of separation of power in a much more explicit or implicit way, but all of them speak about that, right? Now, where I want, I want to come home. We have a problem now in the European Union, clearly a pragmatic problem which concerns uh, the violation of the rule of law by certain national authorities. Now, in my opinion, and I'm going to be very contentious here, and uh, I am expecting some challenge on that, 
In my opinion, this violation of the rule of law does not affect specifically, or does not affect specifically certain categories within the notion of the rule of law, specifically legality and, cert and legal certainty. If you look at the way in which the Hungarian authorities mainly, perhaps not so much the police, but the Hungarian uh, authorities behave, they try to secure all the time legality and legal certainty. So there is a paradox here. Rather, what they are trying to do is to undermine the principle that is behind separation of power, checks and balances, right? So they are attacking something which emanates from the value, rule of law, but is not exactly the same as other elements within the rule of law. Now, importantly, breaches, the violators, those governments, appeal to the democratic principle to justify their action. And they have a very clear point. They have a very clear point because no state has a symmetrical separation of powers to other states. So the combination of the different elements that make the separation of powers varies among states, and this adjudicated on the basis of democratic decisions. So democracy plays a very important role here, and in theoretical terms, uh, I, I, I bracket myself here a little bit, I may sound a little bit like uh, defending Poland and Hungary, it's just in theoretical terms I hear some of the arguments they may, they have some, some reason behind that. So they argue that democracy allows some kind of modulation of the, of the way in which separation of powers operates. Now, what is then the challenge that we have here? And that's the, the, the main thing in my, in my presentation. Um, I think we have, a, we have a significant challenge um, to the relation between constitutional, principle, constitutional principles in this two-level polity. Why? Because domestic rule of law and democracy provide a very strong basis to question European Union democracy. So all the criticisms about democratic deficits is based on the assumption that the national democracy works well. That's a basic assumption. Whether it's true or not is based, is premised on the constitutional construction of those two principles at the national level, right? But on the European Union level, only the adherence to the value of rule of law permits to challenge domestic string <coughs> construction of the principle of separation of powers because the European Union has not got a similar principle that can be contraposed, right? So to construct an attack on the national level, it has to appeal to the broader term rule of law, which does not incorporate specifically the model of separation of power, which is common to the domestic level. I don't know whether I'm making myself, myself clear. What I'm saying is that there is not a symmetry in the kind of arguments that can be opposed to the national modeling of this uh, separation of uh, powers. Now, um, here, and uh, I want to move to a conclusion because my time is, uh, my time is perhaps uh, running. Uh, the, challenge, the challenge that we have, uh, we have to face here is that, uh, that uh, the European Union uh, does need to make clear and to um, really expose that uh, the kind of values that are identified in Article 2 inspire the constitutional structure of the European Union itself. So if the European Union declares a commitment to the rule of law, in any meaningful understanding of the rule of law, rule of law involves separation of powers, which is not a principle which is characteristic to the constitutional structure of the European Union. Here we have a, contra a deep contradiction and a big, big problem that is the source of the problems, the theoretical problems that the European Union has to confront national governments who breach precisely the principle of separation of, of powers. Now, what will be my, uh, my conclusion? Uh, perhaps I went too, too quick, uh, having to account. Okay, three minutes. What will be my conclusion? Um, is there any alternative to the possibilities to reconcile democracy and the rule of law to the one that has been permanently rehearsed at the European, at the national level? Uh, I simply don't, cannot imagine uh, any alternative. Uh, but I mean, by that I mean that uh, democratic means serve to uh, establish some kind of uh, articulation between the different powers of the state. And I don't see we can, how we can bypass this democratic process to establish this articulation among different, different um, problems. And uh, deepening European constitutional principles uh, seems to me that requires enhancing democracy too. 
And this leads, in my opinion, to a kind of more federal, more federal model. So the only way to restore this lack of, uh, mm, or the relative lack of isomorphism between the European Union level and the national level is to move towards a much more federal model. And finally, if I, if I am allowed, I would like to perhaps to add those, uh, a couple of things to this, uh, uh, to this conclusion. First, there is a practical, a practical, um, a practical derivation of what I said, which is about, in very practical terms, how the European Union goes about policing breaches of the rule of law at the national level. And uh, specifically, there have been some proposals to deeply involve the European Court of Justice as adjudicator of systemic breaches of the rule of law. And I think it's a bad idea. It's a very bad idea. And why is it a very, very bad idea? Because the rule of course within national system are premise, are based on the assumption that there is a very clearly defined separation of powers based on a democratic exercise. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. If we do that at the European Union level, probably we will empower the European Court of Justice as a kind of meta-constitutional court because we'll be adjudicating between powers at the national level but also in the vertical dimension. And of course, this could be decidable, but I don't think we have legitimacy for that. So this one of the first uh, practical implication of this conclusion. And then a second one, which is much more pragmatic, perhaps for our project, is that if we are going to propose um, eventual changes uh, to the treaties, perhaps we need to think in something which uh, addresses the lack of uh, constitutional isomorphism between the two levels. So uh, although perhaps it would be too radical to suggest that uh, uh, treaty reform should reflect some improvement in separation of powers, nevertheless, I think this idea should be somehow in the background of our reflections if we are going to be um, coherent. So thank you very much, and apologies for the speed I have introduced to my presentation. That was even fast for myself. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. Now we can allow 15 minutes for the discussion. Collier uh, Aube, uh, Catholic University of Leuven, senior member, research manager at the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies and Assistant Professor for European Studies at the Faculty of Social Sciences at the same university. Thank Thanks. you very much. Uh, thank you very much for a most interesting uh, panel, uh, which brings together, again, very different views <coughs> on what uh, we're actually talking about. Uh, in this panel, we're talking about legitimacy. And in fact, the uh, work package, um, as we saw earlier today, tries to clarify in the end of this project uh, the notions of legitimacy and uh, uh, also wants to drive research on the conditions under which democracy and the rule of law as understood in the EU context can lead to legitimacy and authority for the EU. So this is very ambitious, but um, it's also very important as we have heard. Now, it has been said by uh, Cesare Pinelli uh, uh, before that actually legitimacy could be looked at through the uh, infamous uh, definition, input, uh, output, and throughput legitimacy, governing for the people, governing by the people, and governing with the people. And in fact, when, when uh, listening to the presentation of uh, Lise Rue at the beginning, uh, I was... Uh, Wondering, I was wondering about her remark that the permissive consensus came to an end um, with uh, and around the time of the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, my question basically um, for Lisa in that respect is whether we could argue perhaps that the end of the so-called permissive consensus has also questioned uh, a method uh, by which the EU has been legitimized and that is basically the uh, method of um, uh, and through output legitimacy. Uh, output legitimation, so to speak. Has this come to an end actually <coughs> with the end of the permissive consensus? And I think it's also important to remind ourselves and to ask ourselves how we can best then describe the post-permissive consensus period, because if it has come to an end, something must have followed. And uh, in fact, uh, Marx and Hore have uh, argued that instead of permissive consensus, we are now in the period of constraining dissensus, 
with the powers arising, um, which we know <coughs> around the Eurosceptic parties, populism, but also, and most importantly, contestation overall, uh, which makes it very difficult for citizens to accept the decisions being taken for them on the European level. So can we, instead of the, um, uh, the time of um, uh, permissive consensus, speak of a per post-permissive consensus uh, time uh, that is uh, marked by constraining the census? That, I think, is very important, and we should keep that in mind. Does it have an impact on output legitimacy? And in that sense, it makes it easy for me to also go to the presentation of uh, Cesare Pinelli. Because if it's true that uh, output legitimacy was so important, and in fact, you mentioned that uh, there is a twofold problem in the EU, it may actually have had a problem with input legitimacy and output legitimacy. But let's remain for a second with the notion of output legitimacy, because it has been so dominant in the debates. Uh, if output legitimacy um, is so important, and if it can legitimize the European Union, at least up until uh, recently, I would argue, can we perhaps uh, also argue uh, that this output legitimacy needs additional objectives, needs additional principles that come with it. Uh, especially I'm thinking, for example, of principles such as coherence and consistency. Uh, principles that the EU has been very keen to establish to push its effectiveness, to actually make sure that the coordination amongst member states but also its institutions would guarantee output legitimacy. Is that a necessary precondition for the EU to exercise output legitimacy? And if so, and if the EU is not able to arrive at coherence, does it undermine its credibility, both inside and outside the European Union? And I know that uh, Cesare Pinelli has worked on this, so I guess he is quite familiar with the question. Um, Perhaps one additional question on the link between input and output legitimacy. It has been um, said quite often uh, that, in fact, in order to arrive at greater output legitimacy, you need input legitimacy. The two are not to be separated, but you need to see these two concepts together. <coughs> the argument being that those who have to live under EU law should also be involved in its making and that through the involvement in its making, if only by representative means, this will enhance the effectiveness of the laws to be enacted and implemented because of a greater acceptance. Would you agree with this? Would you th agree that it's not only two separate um, ways of legitimizing the European Union, but actually that we have to look at these two together? Then I would like to go on and comment uh, on the very interesting presentation of Nicola Lupo. I fully agree that it is important uh, to look at the parliaments, to also look at what you called the intersections of parliamentary procedures, especially when we want to make sense in a multi-level setting of the way how the European Parliament, national parliaments can interrelate can actually work also together towards a greater scrutiny of what is being decided in the European Union. And there is a good reason that there is a lot of literature on this, obviously, to um, argue that uh, this uh, separation of levels needs to be, in a way, overcome. Now, first question is, do we really see a willingness on the side of the national parliaments on the one hand and on the side of the European Parliament to actually use also, let's say, these intersections to the most to scrutinize. Another, and I think more fundamental question is, do we actually know that parliamentar parliamentarians are interested in scrutiny? I remember one interview 
that I did in the European Parliament, and I will not disclose his name here, but the MEP taught me, you know, I'm not interested in scrutiny. I want to make politics. I'm interested in policies. So my big question is, are we really sure that the European Parliament, which currently is obsessed with Spitzenkandidaten, which with actually making its way into the policy uh, making realm of the institutions, is so interested in scrutinizing those which it will actually empower. I'm wondering whether the Spitzenkandidaten have not actually uh, also fed into a new relationship between, on the one hand, for example, the Commission and the European Parliament on the other side. Let me then go uh, and have a quick comment on the very interesting um, uh, intervention by Andrea San Giovanni. Now, I am not a political philosopher, so allow me to uh, give you and ask you questions from my humble political science perspective. So I very much like the idea that you say um, we have to think about the ends <coughs> and that justice may actually serve us to understand what the ends could be. Now, you also gave, and I will hit on this, so to speak, you gave the wonderful illustration of the bullseye. Now, if the bullseye is justice, and if we aim for justice, if I understand you correctly, can you think of a shot that hits justice in the bullseye, but that misses to hit democracy? Are we sure that actually, um, and what would that mean for the European Union? Um, is, is the EU legitimized enough when it can show that it aims for justice but that it is not able to aim for democracy? Uh, and related to that question would be my question, is the attempt to hit the bullseye enough or do we need to see the impact on justice? Do we need not in the end a justification that actually we make an impact on justice and that only the attempt is not enough. I think this is important because it will obviously be uh, a big question how such a way of legitimizing the EU can be used in practice uh, to actually think about how actors can use the argument and I'm wondering whether it could not be misused. Um, that uh, is um, one of the concerns and the question related to this um, to you. Finally, for Carlos, thank you very much. Um, just a matter of clarification. So I understand you correctly that you say that, Prince, that the separation of power is an unknown to the EU. Uh, that actually, it, uh, if we go far enough, uh, the similar way how at the moment member states may breach the rule of law for different reasons by putting democratic arguments out there and saying we are serving the will of the people. The EU is also breaching the rule of law, but in a different way. Um, if that is the argument, um, uh, what remains of the rule of law in, in, in the European Union? Uh, what is uh, the uh, prospect uh, for the rule of law to give legitimacy? Uh, back to the European Union, something that we have to address, uh, I guess, uh, not only uh, in general, but also more specifically in our project. Thank you very much for this most interesting panel. Thank you very much. So we have 13 more minutes. I think we can add some more minutes on top of that. So I think we can gather, say, three questions, uh, please keeping it short, and then we can leave the floor to the speakers for a very brief reply. Please. <coughs> if you, of course, can introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Joe Corkin. Um, I, I, I've allowed myself to be provoked by Andrea's uh, comments. So, so um, I, I'd, I'd like to, to take on your, your, your argument. First of all, <laughs> To, to summarize how I understand in, in really simplified terms, 
I think you're making an argument for uh, a kind of uh, a, to, to take a substantive idea of justice sort of primarily first, the, 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 the objective, and then what I would characterize as a more sort of procedurally uh, a sort of a, 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 a framework within which you would seek substantive justice of, of the sort of the liberal democratic conception um, and, and uh, which would which would leave empty that question of what substantive justice is and and then what you did was you worked through these three theories um, uh, 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 and, and sort of very Socratically sort of um, disputed them mm -hmm. now what I'd like to do is maybe and I'm going to try and do this very very quickly is to reverse back through them in, in a sort of defense of those theories, but, but, but flesh them, f not flesh them out because I haven't got the time, but to, 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 to make them less straw men, if you like. Um, the first thing that on this idea of legitimacy, I think we could only, and this is the point that Carlos and, and I think all that also Kalia would take, were, were, were making, on the idea of the European Union, we can only understand the legitimacy of the European Union, in my opinion, uh, by running it together as, as a two-level polity. So it, 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 it's, its legitimacy doesn't exist in isolation from the legitimacy of the nation state, that they have to hang together. Um, and that what they're doing uh, is there's, there's the citizens of the European Union and the citizens of the nation state have an expectation in this asymmetric relationship between them and power wielded over them by the state or the European Union, but collectively this, this, this polity within which they're situated, this privileged discretionary authority that's wielded over them, that, that, that ought to be exercised through norms over which they have some influence. Um, and that, that then in, creates the obligation on them to obey. So that requires some form of uh, national and supranational institution to deal with the, uh, the, the external effects of the nation state, but also the recognizing that we still want to be uh, we still want to be self-determining within the nation state. So it organizes deliberation, and that was the second of your, of your uh, uh, theories that you were contesting. Um, your, your, uh, your main problem, I think, was essentially was again about this procedural emptiness, about it being uh, without this target of the of, of justice, um, that that it's just deliberation, but to what end? Well, can that deliberation to a particular end be the assumption that there is a right answer, that there is some justice to which we are aspiring towards, uh, that there is a right answer, but but we have no way of knowing what it is. But because we all commit to deliberating with one another, then we keep on doing it forevermore through these, this, two, this double level polity. Um, and that then takes me to the last of your, um, uh, of your uh, I, 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 I'll, I'll take the liberty of calling them straw men, um, which is that we close that out through the, the, the democratic vote at the end, because we recognize that the ongoing process of seeking justice that we cannot know what it is that you would put first and I would put last is that we're organizing this is that we need to close it out and, and create norms within which we can we can live at any one time but they're always open to reopen to be re-problematized but we close it out through a vote but that vote itself that democratic process that we use uh, doesn't suggest <clears throat> any more that we need a substantive notion of social justice we just have to commit that we're trying to find one as national citizens, but also as European citizens. So I really apologize for taking more. Okay, I mean, this is, this is, was a major delegitimizing move to me as a president, but uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, other questions, but please, please, please keep them short. Are there any other issues? Okay, so we can take that the first question was taken the time of three questions, and this is giving back legitimacy to the president. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I say, you know, a couple of minutes uh, to, to answer, and uh, we just uh, follow the original order. So, Lisa, please. Well, thank you. Um, if I got your question right, 
call your, you off for the legitimization through. <coughs> Sorry. It's, it is actually on, is it, but it's. Should I? No. Yeah, just keep, keep it closer. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, so whether this legitimization through output com did come to an end uh, with the end of the permissive consensus. Uh, to be honest, I know I don't think so, but I think it's at this point of time that a gap starts to develop between uh, <laughs> economic integration and uh, the implementation of the single market, uh, which makes the EU start to register in the lives of, of people, uh, but where at the same time the EU does not manage to develop mechanisms for participation and control um, to match this increased engagement. Um, so no, I, I don't think it was the end of legitimization through output, but it reflects the fact that the EU is becoming more complex, much more diverse, and it, everything is becoming much more difficult. Thank you. Okay, thank you. President? Yes. Now, my <coughs> intention was uh, just that of affording uh, a brief uh, <coughs> story of the of this dichotomy, uh, while uh, instead Colia uh, began uh, correctly to uh, give teeth to this uh, to this dichotomy. So uh, he uh, asked uh, whether, <coughs> uh, for what concerns output legitimacy, which I think too is crucial for the EU, has remained crucial in spite of the increasing importance of the input whether coherence and consistency are, uh, are the points that are needed for ensuring uh, output legitimacy. The answer is uh, it depends. Because the output legitimacy was um, initially conceived uh, as the uh, result uh, of the action of a, a continental market. So in this case, uh, the negative integration, it was not needed, coherence and consistency, but your uh, re reference to these two words is not uh, uh, casual. Uh, these are typical legal words <laughs> that evoke something that is not comprehended in the, in the dichotomy, which is rather pol political, no, politological uh, dichotomy. If you insert this, well, you have insert what, uh, why not legal certainty? Yes, also legal certainty. So the, the rule of law, so the, the, the result of the rule of law. So the output uh, legitimacy, uh, shift, there is a shift here, a sh it shifts from uh, the, um, the action of the, the F effects of a, a continental market instead of a national market to the rule of law, uh, as it is, it, it is needed, it must be applied to the EU instead of to the state. Mm. So, uh, well, in this case, my answer is yes, of course. But it is important, much more important, to clarify the distinction, I think, more, more than the, uh, my answer, which is practically irrelevant. Uh, second, uh, yes. Um, I think that there is a strict connection between the two, but uh, for me the important thing is to say that this doesn't mean that uh, uh, the uh, input uh, legitimacy, the, the opposite of the input legitimacy now is a, 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 a technocratic governance, no? And uh, uh, as and the rest is populism. So th this opposition uh, tend to obscure you know, our minds. Uh, and this at the expenses of democracy. So my, if we, uh, if we think at what I wrote, my idea was to return back to 20 years ago and to tend to uh, for the reconstruction of what and who and which institutions in particular provoked this tension with which we are have to cope with. Thank you. Nicola. 
Thank you, Kolya, for your questions. Uh, you are calling, asking me to come back on the intersection of parliamentary <coughs> procedures. Uh, I'll do, uh, I'll answer your questions just uh, clarifying one point. When I'm talking about Euro national parliamentary procedures, I, it is sufficient in my view that one parliament takes part to them and some institution of the other level. And there are rules given by both legal orders. Uh, this um, makes the, the category a bit uh, wider than uh, the mere uh, intersection <coughs> between parliaments. Um, that, that in, in, in just for, to give you an example, you are, you are asking uh, if there is willingness to, to use this procedure. Uh, Article 50 of the treaty is a Euro-national parliamentary procedure in which both the European Parliament and the uh, uh, UK parliaments were very willingness, <laughs> to, uh, had a huge willingness to, to take part of the process, and they ma even managed to do it. So, uh, and they are not something that are, uh, I mean, it's physiolog fully physiological dynamics in, uh, in the EU composite constitution, in my view, at least. But, uh, then the other, po the other point is, are um, members of parliaments really interested in scrutiny? Uh, this uh, excellent question has two level uh, uh, answers, if you want. One is more theoretical, if you like. Uh, I'm rather convinced in analyzing mainly the Italian parliament, I must say, but I can I, um, try, I think that this uh, kind of reasonment can be extended also to other parliaments. That parliamentary procedures are not monofunctional. Uh, parliaments are political bodies and they can push uh, different functions in every procedure, more or less. So it's not, and that's also more concretely the second level of the answer, of the answer to your question. Uh, to the powers of scrutiny and directions that every national parliament exercise, or overs even oversight, but scrutiny and direction is more precise, to, uh, towards its own government, national parliaments are fully able to influence EU legislation, even more than through the early warning mechanism. So they are taking part to the legislative process of the EU through the scrutiny of the direction of their own governments. So I would not stick too much into distinguishing legislation and scrutiny, if you want to simplify a bit my answer. Thank you. Thanks for, uh, very much, uh, Kolya. And uh, I think I can, I can respond uh, maybe uh, to both questions at the same time, because they're, they're a similar sort of flavor, and that way uh, we can let other um, people in. So in a way, what, what I sense is you're asking me, well, what about, are you a skeptic of democracy? Is that what comes out from this? Is somehow democracy um, becomes something dispensable? No, I, I shouldn't uh, be interpreted that way. Of course, um, I think democracy is a requirement of justice. Uh, but the way I think of it, rather, is that the justice, as I was referring to it, substantive justice, or um, in, I uh, um, focused specifically on socioeconomic uh, justice. I think of democracy and what we'll call substantive justice for now as on a par and justified by a prior commitment uh, to the value of equality. Um, so this is a familiar story. Um, among political philosophers. So the idea is that uh, the main thing is to understand what it means to treat another person as an equal. So when we're talking in the domain of political power and the exercise of political power over others, then treating as an equal might require, might because it depends actually, it's, it's quite complicated, but uh, might require, will often require de democracy, what we mean roughly, as some form of democracy, accountability, responsiveness, and so on. Uh, but at the same time, equality requires quite a lot of us when, we're, when we think, what does uh, treating another as an equal require when we're talking about health, or social policy, or tax policy, or fiscal policy, and so on. Uh, and so they're on a par uh, from that point of view and need to be justified by a, a more foundational look at uh, what um, Carlos called the values underpinning these principles, principles of democracy and principles of substantive uh, justice. So my argument was just to say that it's a mistake to think that somehow democracy is privileged, that we should be thinking primarily in terms of democratic structures and then leave the justice bit to further deliberation. 
or to leave it open-ended because it's subject to so much disagreement. That's a, a very common argument you hear around, and it's very misguided. Uh, that was the, the point of, um, of, of my intervention. Uh, I should also say the other point was to say it's amazing how in uh, European you know, Union debates often, and this has a more practical side to it too, uh, the debate seems to be how can we get them to love us? Right? How can we get publics to love us? That's what legitimation means. It's like we're really good. The EU is this wonderful thing. The problem is with the people. So how do we get them? How do we win their legitimacy? This is the way, uh, it, which is an odd way to speak um, because what I was suggesting is that we should turn it around and say, well, as a member of the public, asking yourself, should I respect that institution, uh, what reasons can you give me? And so the, the debate, or at least the normative debate, should be much more in giving those reasons. Right? The reason can't be, oh, because it will get you to love us. That, that makes no sense. Oh, this is the reason why we should have these institutions, is because they'll get much more legitimacy. When the person is asking, why should I think these are institutions are legitimate in the first place? Why should I respect them? Which is a substantive question, what I've uh, suggested, about justice, about equality, about fairness, and so on. Um, so, so that was, uh, you know, my intervention, as it were, against a certain tendency when people are talking about the EU uh, to, to somehow eliminate that question, to keep it, to push it away, and to think really the question is one about getting them to love us. That's what a legitimacy crisis means. They don't love us, you know. So how can we get them to, to see what we're doing is good, which is kind of the wrong way. And I think that may explain, in part, what a lot of the populist um, resentment now towards you know, the liberal elite and the elite is because of this tone of debate is exactly one that doesn't take seriously the first order concerns of, uh, of, of the citizen. So thank you very much, Kolia, for your, uh, for your question, which is uh, just for recalling it. Uh, whether the separation of powers are known to the European Union. Uh, I, that was not my thesis. My, my thesis is that the more the European Union appeals to its own values to protect them at the national level, the more evident the default or the faults in the constitutional principles of the European Union emerge. <coughs> right? so that, that was the whole point. So the more that you put in front of, it, of in the front of the debate rule of law, the more evident is that one of the elements of the rule of law, separation of powers, is perhaps missing in the construction of the European Union level. And that's a kind of uh, paradox that has to be addressed. Uh, that was my, my whole point. Now, the <coughs> second question is what remains of the European Union as a legitimate, sorry, rule of law as a legitimation mechanism of the European Union. I think a lot, uh, but a lot in a partial way because everything has to do with uh, one of the branches of one of the three powers is very solidly constructed. So judicial power, we don't have any kind of doubt about this integration of the national judiciary as a European Union European Union judge, and also the principles operating then, like uh, legality, certainty, due process, uh, elaboration of law according to established procedure, they are there. So they have a strong, a strong legitimizing fact, uh, a strong legitimizing value. But that applies only to one of the branches and partially to some of the principles operating in decision making. But there are other things. If I was going to raise the question to you, th there is a concentration of executive power in the European Union. There are two ways in you can respond to this statement, and they will point to this kind of contradiction. One thing you can say, yes, there is a lot of concentration of executive power because certain governments are concentrating powers in their hands. But an alternative and parallel way to respond to that will say, there is a concentration of executive power because national governments are the ones who run the European Union through increasingly intergovernmental mechanism. So that illustrates that the uh, one of the elements of uh, separation of powers is not really well worked out in the European Union. And one of the <coughs> sources of uh, deficiencies because anyone at the national level can, can, can argue, hey, you are blaming us about uh, this concentration of powers in national executives, will the same happen systematically at the European Union? And the difference is that the national level will have at least some pretension of having a democratic process backing that, which you don't have the same one at the European Union level. And that's the kind of a structural uh, element I was trying to highlight in my, in my presentation. Thank you.
All right. So thank you very much indeed to all the speakers, to the discussants, and uh, of course to you for being patient and listening to all these debates. I don't have any merit on this because I'm just transmitting what the organization told me. We have got five minutes break, <laughs> and after that we go on with our keynote speech. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>
note, which is on my pleasure and honor to introduce, uh, and uh, some final conclusive remarks. So as I said, it is my pleasure and honor to uh, introduce, uh, even though Andreas Follesdal doesn't need any introduction, uh, our last uh, but not least uh, keynote speaker. Uh, as you know, Andreas uh, is a professor of, poli of political philosophy at the University of Oslo. He is co-director of Pluri Courts, a center of excellence for the study of the legitimate roles of the judiciary in the global order, and the principal investigator of the European Research Council Advanced Grant Multi-Rights, which is on legitimacy of multi-level human rights judiciary. So you see we have here many of the key words uh, of this uh, workshop and also this project. And uh, I think that uh, he will uh, share with us uh, some ideas and also ideas enriched by the debate of today, he told me. So Andreas, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation to come and the particular honor to conclude this. Thanks to the organizers, the university, uh, to the planners of the, of the very important research project. Um, and as I told um, when I accepted, I will prepare um, a presentation, but uh, knowing the quality of the presentations, I will be changing my mind while I speak, while you speak. And so I have agreed, I might, I have tried to cut my original presentation a bit to fit all the new insights, but still I'm afraid that I will run a little bit over time. And, and so we have given, I have, I have authorized the chair to stop me. So this addresses some of the issues of the previous one. Um, and um, I'm very grateful that the, the previous speaker of the panel, Andrea San Giovanni, um, was the last one going. So I will be continuing not only in the way we spell our first name now, but also in some of the, the, the perspectives that I will be bringing to this. So I want to address this issue of the challenges um, by helping uh, us reconsider or re, um, rephrase what exactly are these legitimacy challenges of the European Union. I want to point to four of the challenges that have struck me when thinking about this and listening more during uh, the presentations today. And then go back to what I thought I, uh, I was asked to do. So what, might, what roles might the European courts play in the legitimacy challenges and responding to these? For democracy, the rule of law, enhancing the authority and the legitimacy of the EU. And then I might conclude. So what are the legitimacy challenges? How are we to understand these very, this very con uh, contested set of concepts? Um, again, uh, the, in a, the, the philosophical approach to this is to say, well, if the European Union institutions are the solutions for citizens and states, what exactly are these problems? And do the European Union institutions <coughs> actually help solve those problems without creating new ones? So that is the problem of legitimate authority as I see it. And this, I think, goes very well in hand with, with Andrea's presentation. So if we ask, so when under which conditions are the European Union institutions legitimate authorities over citizens and European member states? Again, I think this is one way of understand, of, uh, it's, it's, we specify that in the way uh, loyal to reconnect. When is the EU justified in having and exercising the various legal competences that the EU de facto has? Partly de jure, but also partly de facto. My approach as a political philosopher is to say um, when the union institutions help citizens and states pursue their appropriate objectives. So the purpose of the union as are the purposes of the states need to ultimately be decided on the basis of what do individuals have good reasons to do. And so for those of you who hear Joseph Braz in the background, I think that's quite accurate. From this perspective, this is a completely misguided understanding of the relationship between the nation states and the European Union. The, the nation states are not the means for EU progress. Rather, 
The question is, what do citizens have reason to do? We have reasons to pursue our own life plans and to interact with others on fair terms within just institutions. And states, their purpose is to help citizens pursue those interests in various complex ways, both for citizens and to some extent also for non-citizens outside and inside their borders. So those, those are the ultimate objections. Those are what we have reason to do. And the question then, um, what are the tasks that EU institutions do that help us and states perform those and secure those objectives? What tasks do the EU institutions actually serve helping us pursue those objectives? And this, for those of us who are also are aware of the Federalist Papers tradition, um, Madison says this very clearly, we have to think of the federal governments and the local governments as different agents and trustees of the individual people um, with different powers designed for different purposes, but ultimately their purpose is to help us individuals better act as we have reason to do. And we would, now, of course, now here add the EU, international institutions, and so forth. This was much easier before we got a historic perspective that I want to just repeat. The EU was in, intended to help bring peace and secure peace, a global public good in various ways, including how economists would like to specify this. It would benefit all, no particular deep burdens on some. Um, we see this in the Schumann uh, Declaration, and again, most of the people in the audience know this by heart, so I won't read it out. Um, of course, critics are saying, well, it's not obvious that the EU was actually a necessary for this, because democracies don't really fight each other ever anyway, um, our political science colleagues tell us. Um, so the EU did not serve a useful task for this. The states could do this alone. On the other hand, the rebuttal would be, the EU would help European states remain democratic, and so avoiding war. And again, as we was brought out earlier today, the EU is still trying to help states remain democratic and rule of law abiding. Now, the tasks are far more complex. It is not only peace, not only global public goods in the sense, <coughs> The tasks, the objectives of the European Union are far more contested, and the distribution of costs and benefits is far more clear and contested. So what do I have in mind? Again, we all know the relevant articles from the Lisbon Treaty by heart. I'm not going to read this out, uh, but it is full of tasks. So the preamble and, the, and Article 2 has a lot of different tasks specified that this is for the European Union to do, helping states and individuals in their objectives, right? Solidarity, democracy, economies, progress, peace, security, progress, free movement of persons, ever closer union, you name it, within constraints, respecting history, culture, identity, tradition, sustainable development, environment, subsidiarity, rule of law, respect for human rights. So this is a quite complicated march, set of marching orders. These are, the, these are the objectives to be pursued within some constraints. Much more difficult than peace. So how can the European Union institutions do these tasks better than individuals and states could do so simply by coordinating? Uh, by intergovernmental agreements and so forth. Why, under which conditions, uh, is it necessary to delegate authority to the European Union level to in pursuit of these tasks? That is the question that needs to be explained in order to start to understand why and when the EU are, institutions are legitimate on this account. And we have to see this. Um, and there may be five different ways, at least, that these institutions might be contributing. And I, I would argue these, again, are indicating ways of bringing the EU closer to the people, showing the ro role EU institutions actually contribute in performing tasks that benefit individuals, much more well justified than somehow trying to show why individuals should love the EU institutions and the Commission in particular. 
So partly the EU institutions could help address collective action problems, coordinating, reduce the risks of, of free riding. Some, some of these tasks will be promoted by allowing the EU to help states pre-commit and increase trust also towards its own citizens that it is respecting human rights, for instance. EU institutions can help provide much needed external monitoring, so increasing the transparency and help provide assurance to citizens and states um, that rule of law standards are being followed, that the constitutional constraints are being respected within the EU and within the member states, um, because free riding is, uh, remains a, an important challenge for some of the common objectives. A fourth contribution is to manage and s implement conflicts about how to specify that myriad of obje objectives and how to balance these objectives uh, between economic growth, for freedoms, um, development, um, environmental protection, and how to allocate the benefits and burdens among individuals and states in Europe. So that's again. One possible task that the EU institutions may do um, in promotion of the interests, ultimately, of individuals. Domestically, this is partly, as we heard earlier today, this is partly what scholars do. And importantly, those kinds of contestations about exactly how do we want to secure the various objectives of economic growth, uh, minority protection, and so forth, that's the stuff of deliberative democratic arrangements securing that alternatives are being uh, identified, explored, implications secured, whether the politicians we put in charge of this actually have done what they ought. Um, so that's one reason for the input legitimacy. We need some way of settling these contests about the purposes um, and how to specify these, on these honorable good objectives. Where the European Union so far is too opaque and where people suspect, more or less well-grounded, that those important balancing, those important specifications are done by trained economic experts who think the four freedoms should override all other considerations. And the fifth role is to provide transparency about this. So help remind and assure citizens that the EU is actually carrying out this ta these tasks. If the EU institutions are indeed doing it, or assure citizens that the EU institutions are in fact not performing these tasks. So that's somehow the sort of connection that I would suggest is helpful for discussing the, what is required for the EU institutions to be legitimate when they are claiming to have authority over states and individuals. So here are four challenges uh, that I think we need to take very seriously. I'm going to skim through some of these for, for, the, um, uh, for considerations of time. Where I'm partly drawing on the tradition of, of federal political thought, and there's a big discussion whether the EU is a federal, element, federal state, uh, federal non-state, and so forth. What's important here is that it is a legal and political order with some federal elements. The final legal authority is dispersed between at least two, la two layers, and we've heard already sometimes in three layers in, in, the, in, the, in the federal uh, European states, it'll be three layers at least. So first of all, there are, there's this challenge that the EU has many tasks or objectives with these different constraints. So this requires creativity so as to avoid the avoidable trade-offs between the different objectives. It needs to make sure that all of the policies are actually respecting the various constraints, be it environment, minority protection, human rights, and so forth. And it needs to handle these very difficult <coughs> priorities. Which objectives should be maximized? Which needs to be satisfied? Which should serve actually as side constraints while others will be maximized? Where any choice will impose burdens. Any choice will impose benefits on different segments of the populations, on different states, and on different groups of individuals within each state. So this will be contested, and it will be 
Um, some agreement will always entail benefits and burdens on some groups that could be otherwise. And so again, the question of legitimacy, who should have the authority to make that sort of decision that actually impacts on individuals' lives? The second challenge is of economic inequality and fairness in federal arrangements. Again, if we look at federations generally, federations tend to spend less at the local level than unitary states. And by most measures of economic, soci socioeconomic inequality, on average, there's more inequality within federations than in unitary states. So the Gini coefficient for federal states seems systematically to be higher. There's more economic inequality within, within federations. Why is this? One hypothesis, um, this balance, again, balance is an unfortunate word. Federations need to combine respect for economic equality as a measure of solidarity with some respect for local autonomy for the different regions. And that trade-off may, may be legitimate, but it may mean that in a federation, individuals in different sub-regions may have to come to grips with the fact that they enjoy, they have less claims to an equal share because they live in subunits that enjoy more local autonomy. So there's a trade-off here that merits more exploration, which I hope we will continue in September at the EUI. I have other uh, slides here explaining how you can distinguish between coming together federations, and you could distinguish between some of these coming federations and others and so forth. The third challenge is instability. Again, if we look at federal comparative studies, they are more un unstable than unitary states. So they are always torn between extreme centralization towards a unitary state or fragmentation, some, some subunits leaving uh, the union. So there will be always typically a higher level of what one might think of as constitutional contestation. Which powers should be centralized? Which should be left to the separate units? And that higher level of constitutional contestation is what we must expect of any federal arrangement. And I would argue, including the European Union, and this is one way of, of understanding what's going on in, in the, the discussions about competence allocation. And again, there seems to be evidence that there's the stakes of the constitutional contestation and the troubles of bargaining within those is higher in the very few federations that permit secession. There's a very few left. The Soviet Union had a constitutional right for regions to secede. None of them were stupid enough to try. Ethiopia has a constitutional right, which is causing some trouble now. Um, and our, some of our colleague fellows in, in Belgium are, are contributing to, to uh, not to the instability, but to the reflection <laughs> about this, um, and the European Union. So the exit option affects the contestations and the bargains for, for several reasons. Um, which tasks should be left to the center? Um, how should we think of the burden sharing when it's public knowledge um, that some, uh, some of the units might leave before some of the long-term burdens kick in for them, but, but as soon as they've got the short-term benefits. So the, the whole system becomes far more unstable. And then the fourth challenge is for asymmetric unions. And again, I'm not the expert in the room, um, but there are some federal, arranged, federal systems where the different subunits enjoy different bundles of competences. Um, we have representatives from Spain who could talk to, uh, about this at, at length, uh, Canada, where different regions have different authority when it comes to such issues as language, education, economic policies, and so forth. <coughs> In the European Union, again, um, Multi-speed is one thing, but we have uh, Euroland, we have Schengenland, with only partially overlapping membership. So again, from my perspective, 
for different states, for different citizens within the EU, the point of federal level institutions is different. Their purposes are by design, by agreement, different for, for the members of uh, Schengen Europe and Euro Europe. So there is disagreement about what the Federation is for. And this, again, will require some bargaining in, within some setting when these states have to come together and, dis and decide, so what should, what should be the standards? How should these common institutions balance those great values, those great objectives, when they actually enjoy different powers relative to others? So the union institutions have to carry out different tasks, balancing, again, a problematic term, differently, to be legitimate authorities for the different states and different individuals and citizens of different states within the European Union. And so um, I suggest that these are four aspects that make it particularly difficult for the European Union institutions to show what are their tasks to the citizens and the countries um, of, the, of the Union. And we see this particularly, of course, when they combine. Who is responsible? for the assistance for refugees that land on Italy's shores. Who is responsible and who should bear the burdens of the Euro crisis? Is it those who are hit? Should they and their own democ democracies take responsibility? Should those who chose the domestic, demo dem domestic responses, should other European states or other Euro states be the ones in, in, uh, in held responsible? Or should the, ho the whole European Union and all states. Again, posing these very complex and challenging issues because we have these very different overlapping roles of the, the asymmetric nature of the Union with an exit option um, and where the contestation partly concerns what sort of so solidarity, what sort of human rights, what sort of uh, uh, economic freedom, and how to balance that uh, against it, uh, state uh, national identities. So, uh, what are the tasks for European courts? I had a long, protracted negotiation with the organizers. I, I, not, I, wouldn't, I, want, I don't want to limit myself to EU courts. Let's look at the European courts, including the national judiciaries that we've heard today um, and the European Court of Human Rights. So, what, given that somehow this, if you, if you agree that this is a fruitful way of thinking of what, what are, how to think about the authority, the le legitimate authority of the European Union, what tasks might the courts do in facilitating these tasks of European Union institutions? So some of the courts might actually perform the tasks that help make the EU a legitimate authority. They may monitor and sanction treaty violations to reduce the risk of free riding and so forth. Um, they might strengthen domestic democracy, so uh, strengthen the input democracy component within some states. And again, we have had discussions about some of the some of the member states and the role of the rule of law strengthening by EU institutions, the role of the respect for human rights. Secondly, these courts can take on the very important role of guarding the guardians to monitor whether the domestic authorities and other EU institutions are actually doing what they are tasked to do. Again, here my sense, again from the, supported from the discussion, is that this allocation, the separation of powers and the role of checks and balances in this multi-level system um, is not quite yet fully developed, to put a very diplomatic, optimistic uh, spin on this. A better separation of powers may be needed, and that might be coming out from this uh, project. To check whether these institutions are actually carrying out their tasks as agreed, do they help the collective action problems? Do they help states self-bind in the, in the important ways? And are they doing so while they're respecting the various important constraints, respecting environment, human rights, national history and culture, while complying with subsidiarity? Now, that sort of review is one important aspect of accountability. Um, so checking the, the, the functioning of other uh, EU institutions, but it's also crucial for democratic accountability by citizens. And it's important because it may help remind citizens and officials 
why is it that the European Union's institutions are, is claiming to be a legitimate authority? What tasks is it actually performing? Um, and that is, again, one way that the courts, by, by pushing for this, these review mechanisms, might help remind citizens um, why the European Union institutions are actually providing important tasks. And it helps in the democratic accountability component where citizens um, and states in domestic parliaments and in the European Parliament can check whether EU officials and institutions are actually providing the sort of output legitimacy that was mentioned before. So again, these are important tasks that courts, international courts, may help uh, provide uh, in furtherance of um, helping EU institutions carrying, carry out their tasks. A third role is to manage and con constrain this very high level of constitutional and po political contestation um, to ensure that the side constraints that make, again going back to a discussion before, that helps make the sort of deliberative democratic majoritarian decision making yield results that are worth respecting, in, including freedom of expression, freedom of organization, uh, media, the free, freedom of media, the allow, allowing fact-checking of claims by politicians about what has happened and what will happen if they're, if they're given the, the opportunity, and to assure that those agreements that are being struck are within those constraints, that they don't prevent the democratic functionings of the system, um, and that they don't violate those union values that we started out with this morning, including human rights obligations of the states and of the European Union institutions themselves. So these courts can help provide much needed, credible information to citizens and states whether the domestic and EU institutions are actually carrying out those tasks uh, their legitimacy depends on them actually doing to, a, to some sufficient degree. Um, and here, of course, comes an, an added twist, including we would want some assurance that the Court of Justice of the European Union itself is carrying out its tasks. So domestic courts and parliaments, I would argue, are very important to help as a check and a review mechanism to ensure that the Court of Justice of the European Union itself is performing its tasks correctly. And in particular, that it avoids unjustified centralization in violation of the principle of subsidiarity, in violation of the other constraints uh, respecting national identities. That so those sorts of constraints on uh, on the, Europe, the Court of Justice of the European Union, we cannot trust that body with a long history of centralization to actually self-constrain in the appropriate way. So here again, I think we need to think of a division of authorities, division, uh, uh, some kind of complex multi-level system to prevent risks of unjustified centralization. So again, we have already some tools. We have this, the, the yellow card subsidiarity mechanism to protect national cultures, identities, welfare arrangements. And we have important roles that have, I think, yet to be specified and worked out in, well enough of domestic authorities and the European Parliament and possibly the European Court of Human Rights to reduce the risk that the Court of Justice itself <laughs> constitutionalizes the four freedoms in inappropriate ways, giving undue re priority to the four freedoms relative, say, to human rights. Um, again, those so that sort of monitoring is important to prevent uh, abuse of power or inappropriate use of discretion and to give public assurance that it is, in fact, being handled correctly. Um, now, that, I think, does require more attention to uh, mul the multi-level separation of authority that was mentioned before. Some of this might require treaty change. Some of it we already have in the treaties, but the mechanisms need to be developed. And uh, much might still also be done um, within, without institu constitutional change, uh, the treaty change. How much of this 
can be done without it is not for me to say. Um, but again, the role we have seen of somehow national judiciaries setting limits to EU institution competence creep. Uh, Solange is the most famous. Uh, uh, there are Italian and Danish cases, again, showing this is not something that's only the German constitutional court is engaged in. This, again, might be read as, a, as aspects of a multi-level separation of powers. So it, there are disadvantages and risks. We heard of that earlier today. But there are ways of thinking of this as we need to, to check um, the authority and discretion also of the guardians. So the role of the European Court of Human Rights may be here um, important. Um, now, would there, be, would, there make, would there be a difference by the European Court of Human Rights engaging in this? Again, I could just only flag some issues. Um, there may be disagreement um, between these courts about how are we to understand human rights, and more importantly, how are we to balance human rights with the four freedoms? Um, and how should we balance national identity with human rights and these four freedoms? And again, the experts in this audience know much more than me about the Viking case, the Laval case, that seem to illustrate that the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, it balances uh, the certain human rights, the right to strike, and gives it a much narrower role vis-a-vis -vis the four freedoms than we have reason to believe that the, court of, the European Court of Human Rights would. So there would be different ways of uh, performing proportionality tests by these different courts with, I think, sometimes interesting um, uh, con conclusions. And regardless of whether there will be much disagreement, I would suggest there would be an important role of the European Court of Human Rights to provide assurance to citizens that the European Court, uh, the, the Court of Justice of the European Union, is in fact performing its tasks well, so that citizens can be assured by some independent monitoring that it is actually uh, performing its tasks in the proper way. Uh, where domestic courts and the European Court of Human Rights might both be helpful. So conclusions. I'm suggesting that the legitimacy challenges of the European, Court of, the, the European instit, EU institutions will continue, and I'm not speaking simply as a, as a Norwegian citizen on this, um, but for some reasons that are simply quite deep in the, in the political and legal structure. Um, as in any quasi-federal political order, there will be contestation about what is, where to place authorities um, and competences uh, based on some disagreement about what, we, what the, the central authorities are for. In addition, as long as the EU continues to be asymmetric, there will be factually correct disagreements <coughs> among the different states about what the European Union institutions are for. Um, and that will need some kind of uh, bargained agreement we are, again, the, the issues of whether it's, it may be legitimate but not just may get another twist. Again, going back to a previous discussion today. Um, and again, uh, I would say we should welcome those political contestations because they happen anyway, but they're not as public as they should be. Um, partly because we need to always uh, remain uh, on the lookout to see whether the uh, the powers, the authorities are being abused or in compliance with their proper tasks. Uh, somebody needs to guard the guardians. And this, again, I would suggest is one way to bring the EU closer to the citizens, to remind citizens and authorities at the national and EU level uh, that we have to have public answers to these very important questions. What are the states for? What is the European Union for, based ultimately on how it promotes individuals' interests, also in interests, a commitment to act towards others as equals? And who is it that gets to decide these questions? These are too, much, too important questions to leave to the economist experts in the comitology of the Commission. Um, they need to be made in sufficiently democratic fora where we will disagree about the burden sharing, the benefits um, of, of each alternative. 
um, and where we need credible information about whether the EU institutions are actually performing these tasks. So European courts may contribute to review and monitor these claims about the tasks, about the carrying out of these, uh, these, ob these obligations, and by that they might strengthen domestic and European rule of law institutions. They might facilitate the democratic accountability that is, that is necessary in the European Union. And it may help citizens determine whether we have reason to defer to legitimate EU institutions. And if not, um, what to do? Because they have to show we are performing tasks that are important even when we happen to disagree on particular issues because we think they are stupid or unfair uh, in particular cases. And if they are found to not be legitimate in this sense, if they're not carrying out those, those tasks well, uh, one result may be principled disobedience or exit. Thank you so much. Well, you are perfect on time, oh. so you see. Uh, even though we are a little bit, you know, beyond, I think that uh, there are so many ideas and inputs that we can at least take a couple of short questions if the formulation of the questions uh, uh, is kept short. <laughs> yeah, please. Yes, thank you for, for the presentation. Um, very interesting, especially I think for, for us working in the project, um, the emphasis on what the citizens need and want. I mean, uh, I think if we want to, to, to think in terms of reconnection, uh, we need to, to, to take both uh, ends of the relationship or both sides of the relationship, and uh, uh, I see this as an important message. Um, my, my question is uh, on the impact of federalism uh, the, the consequences that it has. Um, I'm not an expert on this question, but I was wondering whether, in fact, the, the relationship might be reversed. Uh, you know, in the, if, if we, we see these differences between federal uh, um, units and uh, unitary states, it might be because in the first place there was so much diversity uh, and, and this is, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the tensions that, that you, you, you see of the instability uh, might actually not be the consequence of federalism, but federalism might be the consequence of uh, the lack of unity, basically. Uh, so, um, uh, yes, uh, I, I was wondering whether this, this uh, relationship could, could work um, in, in the other direction, and therefore also if that wouldn't be something important to take into consideration when we consider the EU. Thank you. If there are other questions, uh, I think that we can group the questions uh, and then we leave the floor to Andreas. No one else? Good. Yeah. Uh, Please. Yeah, just, uh, just a quick, uh, I don't know if it's a, a question of clarification, but I'm curious where, where you, where you uh, end up on this. So on the, on the right to exit, uh, I sensed a certain... On the right to exit, I sensed a, a certain um, skepticism. Um, do you think it would be better that there wasn't a right of exit in, uh, in, in, in the European treaties? And in what sense better? I add just, uh, it's not a provocation, but uh, in, in, and who is going to assure the citizens uh, that the courts uh, are going to perform rightly their tasks, uh, uh, included uh, the, the European Court for Human Rights? Good, so, uh, so three uh, important questions. So how we, uh, when is dinner? Um, <laughs> there is another <laughs> workshop. <laughs> um, so the impact of federalism, I think this is a very good point. Um, again, if we look at the history of federal thought, it, it, we would 
and, and the history of federations, there seem to be at least two different in interesting categories. One is the holding together federations, where in order to keep the territorial borders, the center will, will give some uh, competence to subunits that are making too much noise. Um, uh, while others are coming together, where previously um, well-functioning uh, states agree for a, a limited set of purposes. Um, and the, it's the latter, the coming together federations have, have larger levels of uh, inequality measured by Gini index and so forth. Uh, but again, it varies quite a lot. The, the, the U.S. is quite extreme. And that's partly because the Constitution is by design set up to prevent equalization. Uh, the German uh, federal system, to the contrary, is more egalitarian than many unitary states, partly because the German Constitution explicitly requires federally, uh, the fiscal equal equalization among the states, the, the, the Länder. So this is, uh, that would be an important area to go through. I have four, to four more slides, but this is, that's where I, I thought that let's cut this. Uh, but of course, large perceived economic inequality may fuel uh, the, the instability, uh, which is a, which is a good, uh, an important point. Um, the right to exit, um, I, d I don't think I have standards for saying whether it would be better to not have it. Uh, I think what we see empirically is that the level of instability is higher because and the, the, uh, the, there's a risk that the resource-rich subunits that can credibly threaten exit can then amass more in the skewed bargaining of allocation of, of, of resources. It, uh, in, in Ethiopia, I think we see this. Uh, this now, but there, the, there are so few cases that it is difficult to generalize. Um, who will check the courts? Again, here I think in some kind of system of division of responsibilities, some mutual checking of courts, uh, some mutual checking of parliaments, um, some accountability through professional standards, again, might be helpful so that the uh, the, the, the members of judiciaries meet, meet with their colleagues and they have to defend their judgments uh, and their reasoning uh, in journals so they are subject to some extent to, to peer pressure. Um, again, some of these courts are more careful to show their reasoning and some are more careful to not show their reasoning. So that, again, would be one way to, uh, to uh, explore some implications of, of this view. Um, I think those are at least a start of, of a dialogue on, on three important issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I think that our long and rich day is going to, you know, reach the end or presumably the beginning of a new workshop, which is in the future, but, you know, just to reassure uh, those people that have been involved in the organization, it's not on you to organize a workshop tomorrow. Uh, it has been a very, I think, a long journey to organize a such a day. So uh, let me thank all of them once again. Um, of course, it would be absolutely impossible to wrap up in two minutes, uh, uh, all the ideas, the arguments, uh, uh, claims, uh, uh, criticisms uh, that we have been debating today. But I think that uh, I can at least uh, highlight a couple of points. Uh, one is, um, you know, if uh, we started with uh, the, the key uh, note um, of Professor Amato, and uh, uh, one of his uh, arguments uh, was exactly about uh, the task and uh, who is supposed, expected, legitimated to perform which task. And this is uh, exactly the, you know, the point of view from which we can see the disconnection uh, between uh, the European Union and citizens, or at least uh, the way we can observe uh, this uh, disconnection uh, to presumably medicate it, uh, to you know, reduce it. Um, in some cases also, uh, having in mind that presumably there is uh, an openness uh, 
for citizens uh, to accept more Europe, not necessarily uh, the position of citizens is uh, to have less Europe, uh, as in some countries uh, many times uh, political, you know, the political elite uh, is used uh, to, to underline. Um, another point uh, uh, which is, uh, I think, important, uh, and uh, again, uh, it, uh, it establishes uh, a, a connection uh, between uh, Professor Amato's talk uh, and uh, uh, Andrea's, uh, Professor Polis' um, <coughs> notes, uh, is about um, the need for um, a communication between institution and citizens, uh, not in terms of reduction of opacity for the legal technicisms uh, that are in the documents uh, of the institutions, but rather to have uh, a sort of, let's say, public accountability, the fact that it is possible for citizens to understand what's going on, but above all, that if something wrong will happen, there is the possibility to check it. I think this is even more important. We cannot expect that everyone is an expert of legal technicisms or technicisms, uh, generally speaking. But we, I think we may agree that we all want, when we delegate power, at least to be sure that if anything wrong is going to happen, there will be a mechanism to, you know, to compensate, uh, to sanction violations. Uh, that's uh, something that is extremely important. Uh, mistakes uh, and errors are in, you know, human history. We do want uh, to have mechanisms uh, to revise them. That's, this is, uh, it seems to me, a minimum standard uh, and presumably holds uh, across uh, boundaries, cultures, uh, different positions, uh, even from the moral point of view. Uh, we have been mentioning also more, you know, differences uh, in the morning. Okay, so uh, I think that now is uh, the time to give the floor to our, you know, Virgilio for the future. What next? Ian. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And let me again organize, uh, uh, let me again, not organize, but congratulate the um, organizers of the conference for this great day. It was a very rich day, very dense program in a certain way, and you see also that now we are at the end of that uh, rich and fruitful day. Um, and I would like to just take a, a number of takeaways from our uh, discussions today, but if you allow me, if you bear with me, I would just like to first share a little personal anecdote with you. Because during during the break of a recent conference I participated in at Paris 1, Panthéon Sorbonne, on Monday the 10th of December last year, I was a bit bored and I couldn't resist the temptation to visit the Panthéon, which is just opposite the street of uh, Paris 1. I had never been before at the Panthéon. I'm not sure if you have ever been, but as you know, if you go to the basement floor, there are the tombs of those great heroes, not all of them, but many of the great heroes of France. And it's a bit of a labyrinth. You have to find your way. Um, they are structured in various corridors. And I found also, to my amazement, that some of those French heroes are together in, with their tombs in a particular vault. And I was actually looking for the tombs of one of my heroes, René Cassin. Why was I looking for René Cassin? Because it was the 10th of December 1948, exactly 70 years before that conference in Paris, that in Paris, the General Assembly of the United Nations had adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to which the Frenchman René Cassin had made such a great contribution. Now, much to my surprise, I found out that the tomb of René Cassin was in the same vault as the tomb of Jean Monnet and the tomb of Simone Veil and her spouse. For me as a Jean Monnet chair, that meant a lot of things, but it really also made me reflect on how incredibly symbolical this post-life reunion 
of these three great figures was. Because all of them have gone through some of the most horrific events of the 20th century. If you read the life of René Cassin, he was hit by German machine fire in October 1914 and kept a traumatic hernia for the rest of his life. Jean Monnet was very much involved, as we know, by organizing supplies uh, to the Allies during the two world wars. Simone Weil, who was a little bit younger than the two other ones, and which I quoted in my introduction this morning in her speech as first president of the directly elected European Parliament, she was a survivor of the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp where she lost part of her family. All three of them had gone through the excesses of nationhood. All three of them, if you look in their lives and their work, resented the absolute version of sovereignty and had come to the conclusion that in a post-war Europe, sovereignty had to be reorganized, that it had to be pulled, that there was, there was a need for a different way of working. And it was a generational choice that was debated in many places in Europe. Also in Italy, yeah. we haven't spoken much about the great Italian founding fathers of European integration, but let me quote from a speech that the Italian Prime Minister Alcide de Gasperi gave before the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe on the 10th of December 1950. He's basically saying the following, and I quote, the rising generation, which is attracted by a coherent and dynamic view of life, hesitates before a choice upon which its very fate may depend. Whether to return to the road that was ours before the war, a road strewn with claims and conflicts based on the moral concept of the nation as an absolute entity, or else to move onwards to the coordination of certain forces, at times ideal and rational, at times instinctive and irrational, in the hope that life may broaden further and the brotherhood of man be extended far and wide." End of quote. I think we may want to revisit some of those great societal debates and European movements that popped up after the Second World War, including in Great Britain, I should stress, where somebody like Winston Churchill was very strongly involved in that European movement. But that's not the aim of my conclusions. My aim is to share with you some takeaways from our rich discussions today. And our, our objective today was formulated as a set of pertinent questions that not only aim to frame our debates today, but also the Reconnect project overall, the puzzle of authority, who does, can, and should exercise authority. Second, what has been the impact of the many crises of the European Union and the challenges to the EU's authority and legitimacy? And then thirdly, how can the EU regain authority and legitimacy? We have heard many excellent contributions in the course of today from our keynote speakers, President Amato, Professor Andreas Follesdal, but also from our great panelists in the two subsequent sessions this morning and this afternoon. I was very struck by what uh, Giulio Amato mentioned this morning, and I noted it carefully. He said, it is not a matter of lack of contact and of distance, Distance does not depend on the miles between Bergamo and Brussels. Also, the US Congress is very far away from Washington state. It's a matter of powers. It's a matter of decisions that have um, basically an impact. His recipe to overcome the legitimacy crisis of the European Union is basically to give more delegated powers and authority to the European Parliament, the areas in which the Parliament's powers are exercised, are perceived, as he said, by our citizens as kind of regulatory agency areas, not enough relevant for the citizens. So his prescription, why not give taxing power to the European Parliament, was, I think, very stimulating, but also very provocateur. I think that to revitalize union um, uh, dynamics in terms of democracy, competences, and powers, that Indeed, this is something very interesting as a uh, kind of um, suggestion. 
whether we fully agree with it is, of course, another uh, matter still. But the underlying tension between a common identity and a national identity, we understood from him, will remain. And actually, there you had the link from his presentation to the final keynote, the quest for finding instruments that satisfy and that find a balance between the two identities in a complex multi-level system. In the first panel this morning on authority, various panelists made sense of authority in the EU and its relationship with legitimacy. Principle of conferral was discussed as a starting point to see how authority is allocated. We heard about constitutionalism and its main function to regulate and constrain authority, while a thicker version of constitutionalism in a certain way also triggers questions of how actors and institutions can be sufficiently legitimized. But it also became clear how EU administrative law can be seen as a basis for a renewed impetus of EU constitutional law through a substantive rule of law concept and how the European institutions and the European Court of Justice constitute in a certain way shields protecting the foundations of the European rule of law. But our colleagues also showed the interrelations between authority and the importance of transparency to strengthen the accountability of EU institutions. Transparency at EU level must be seen as something different from the national level, as something which contributes and allows for greater information of the general public. Finally, accountability of authorized institutions needs to tackle the problem of connection between the EU and its citizens. Do European Parliament elections provide citizens with satisfactory tools to ensure accountability? In fact, the very, uh, say, low voter turnout may contribute to a lack of legitimacy, which by itself then creates a problem of authority. And that lack of legitimacy was also the topic of our second panel this afternoon. We clearly understood that the EU is facing a legitimacy crisis, and that to enhance legitimacy, we need a correct diagnosis. A historical analysis is important in this sense to understand the depth and the nature of the challenges. Moreover, parliaments are crucial for determining legitimacy and accountability. But there are also great conceptual ambiguities in the European Union. Different identities, languages, traditions, legitimacy, legality, legitimization, accountability, responsibility, and so on. Those ambiguities need to be addressed, and work is needed also on procedural intersections between legal orders. And yet, we also understood, and I'm very grateful for that, that justice is a key end for the legitimacy of the EU. We heard about the importance of privileging justice when talking about democracy and legitimacy. It should not have a backseat role any longer. European scholarship needs to pay more attention to fairness and justice, and I would add solidarity, rather than focusing on technocratic aspects of authority. Finally, we also saw that there are possible contradictions between democracy and the rule of law at the EU, at the EU and the national level. So this brings me to my final uh, conclusion Keeping these key takeaways in mind, we, the Reconnect community, are aiming to move forward in our analysis of the key concepts, authority and legitimacy of our project. Only a fundamental and a new understanding of these concepts, including their impact on democracy and the rule of law, will help us to show ways out of the current state of crisis that the EU finds itself in. Thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you. La session est levée. La session est levée.